present at the uh, InfoWars taping sitting next to Mr. Jones and was frankly flabbergasted um, by the level of anger that he saw. And I understand you raised questions about whether that was anger or an act. If it was an act, it was convincing. And you have read the transcript, I presume. You've seen the video, and you've seen that twice I was trying to counsel my client um, about Aristotle and his admonition on anger, that a wise man is angry in the right way at the right time with the right person and by the right means. Mr. Jones is a conspiracy theorist. He believes that there are people out to get him. Guess what? There are. He's been deplatformed from Facebook because of his speech, from PayPal because of his speech. He has difficulty with credit card purchase because of his speech. And he's been sued because of his speech as to Sandy Hill. And we're in the shadow of Sandy Hill. He knows he's not popular in Connecticut, but he's entitled to speak. Now, the speech that's at issue here um, is a particularly ugly speech that was uttered on the public airway um, on Friday night. I sat right there, and he did not uh, uh, threaten Chris Maddie. Um, he mentioned Maddie by name, um, and it was uncomfortable, and it was unpleasant to behold, and I will concede that. But there was no threat. I've litigated the true threat line of cases all the way up to the United States Supreme Court, unsuccessfully seeking certiorari as to the Ted Elkins conviction. And as you were, well, uh, which was sustained by our, our state Supreme Court, as you are aware, true threat are exceptions to the First Amendment. And there's some split in the circuits now about whether they are discerned by means of a subjective or an objective standard. An objective standard requires that the person receiving the comment um, would perceive it as a threat. That Mr. Maddy did, I will accept at face value if that's what their pleadings say. But if you look at the language and you look at some of the reporting this morning, I, I, I sincerely hope that Mr. Jones brings an action against the New York Times. He never threatened to put Mr. Maddy's head on a pipe. And to suggest otherwise is a grotesque misreading of this transcript. Would you agree or disagree that it was harassment? I don't think it was harassment. You can sue Alex Jones and accuse him of all sorts of things put your name on the pleadings and have those in the pleading, hold press conferences, have pleadings mysteriously appear on CNN the day after they're filed. And Mr. Jones is supposed to do what? All we like sheep have gone astray? If they want blood knuckle litigation, they got it. How, but would, you, how would you characterize it? As an ugly outburst and an angry outburst. How would you, did you get a chance to read the um, Maurice versus Chester Housing Authority case? How would you characterize that short, basically? Not even close. Email? Not even close. That email was sexually tinged to a person in a way that was designed to intimidate her at the core of her being, and, uh, and raising questions about her sexuality and things that this man may or may not have liked to do. So you, you find you, your position is that that um, short email was intimidating this, whatever you want to call this 20 minute I'll call it a rant, whatever you do, how it, that was not if it was, Mr. Maddy should be in a new line of work. This is a business, and I said it on the broadcast, this is a business where when you take on a person, you take on the person and you take responsibility for the passions it involves. Then why not plaintiff counsel in the Maurice case? It would be the same thing apply to her. Why, how she should be in a new line of work, but instead, well, Judge, in all due respect, behavior. in all due respect, if I ever say to a woman, you should sit on my face, and, and the court doesn't see the distinction between that and what was uttered here, there's nothing I can do about there. That is just grotesquely different. In this case, Mr. Jones has been held up to the nation as a figure of public ridicule and contempt. Is, does he have to sit silently by? Does he not have an opportunity to respond in kind? Does he not? And okay, you know, the First Amendment says, the First Amendment has protected. Does it give him the right to accuse the opposing counsel of planting child pornography. He did not do so. For the metadata, of asking for the metadata so that he could, so that the opposing counsel could plant the child porn. He didn't say those words, and I defy you to find them in there. That is a suspicion that he has, and I counseled him over and over again. You don't know that. I don't know that. I don't believe that. I've litigated cases against him for 20 well, years. I'm not talking about what you believe. No, no, but I was sitting right there and I saw it. I had the benefit of being an eyewitness and I've read the transcript again over lunch. Somebody put that that, inter, that pornography into Mr. Jones's email. It was not him. And the, we were told that by in a conference call with the Justice Department last week. Who? Who would have a motive to do so? A naive litigant always demonizes their adversary. I tried to walk Jones back from that and say, look, 
Mr. Manning's job is to take you apart, as it is my job to raise questions and take apart the people who sued you. That's what we do. And people talk about restorative justice. We have complex mediation programs because we know the emotions get raw. And experienced litigators are expected to roll with the punches. And sometimes those punches are awkward, and sometimes those punches raise concern. This was not a threat. I, it's been intimated to me that there may or may not be a criminal prosecution in being investigated as a result of that. My head, the response to that is bring it on. This does not satisfy the Brandenburg v. Ohio test. In order for a, an utterance to be a true threat, it has to do more than be um, chilling in its tone. It has to be an imminent threat of immediate violence. And in the context as a whole, how do you go from this video to Mr. Maddy running to court seeking sanctions because he's scared? I mean, he's a former federal prosecutor. Come on. From Mr. Jones's perspective, this is more theater. This is an opportunity. From the day I've gotten involved in this case, it has been code red, one urgency after another, by plaintiffs who waited until the statute of limitations had expired as to most of the claims found a tenuous conspira conspiracy theory to reach back and keep it alive, and now trying desperately to link some false utterance of, um, to a commercial activity so they can run the same game on the First Amendment that they ran on the firearms case in Bushmaster. Well, bring the criminal case on. Let's go. Um, it is not going to pass First Amendment scrutiny, and we think sanctions would be inappropriate in this case. I spoke to Mr. Jones at the lunch hour to alert him uh, to the fact that the court seemed inclined to grant sanctions of some sort, and, and he was flabbergasted by that. I mean, whatever you may personally think of Mr. Jones, he has a right to speak. When we had the days of the penny press in this country, people said far worse. Um, they, would they would encourage the tarring and feathering of other people. And we didn't lock them up for being passionate. Mr. Jones is a so passionate speaker. So he has a right speaker. of free speech, but then I understand you uh, don't agree that anything that took place during that during two broadcasts was in any way harassing or threatening or sought to intimidate, but you would agree that he did not have the right, based on Connecticut law and I'm sure law of other jurisdictions, to threaten, harass, or intimidate the counsel on the other side. I don't think there's any question that he did not, and it is a I, precious I reading of this transcript to suggest otherwise. But, it is too precious. But, but in general, does a party have a right under the First Amendment to threaten, harass, or intimidate the lawyer on the other side? That's my question. As a matter of law, no, but what the facts in this case mean are by no means clear. How this court can reach this, you know, they consider some of the cases, just drawing them at random. City of Claiborne Village, okay, a case where the NAACP was boycotting white um, stores, and they said to people outside, if any of you cross, and excuse my language, if any of you cross this picket line, I'm gonna break your goddamn neck. Somebody was injured. This, the, the speaker, who was an NAAC organizer, um, went, was tried and convicted. That conviction was overturned. Violent speech, our court has held, tumultuous speech is protected unless it is associated with an imminent act of violence. Another example. Um, just, what's, to talk about the integrity of the process here and the functioning of the court and the judicial process and the court's obligation. Focus on that as opposed to criminal. Uh, well, you would ask about crimes, and so I defend it. Now I'll shift to the next curve that you give me the, the, an opportunity to shoot it. This does, you know, I mean, I will understand the, the, the case, and I forget the name. The handbook was the name of the case. You had a three to one. Shane uh, Morris versus Chester Housing Authority. This came out a couple months ago. That, the Housing Authority case is yeah. all I'll remember. Um, you know, um, um, it presents this court with an opportunity, a door through which it could walk through. It's an appellate court decision. I don't know what its status is on certiorari. That was an unusual case because it was a non-party participant. But I would argue that in that case, he engaged in speech that was a, was a potential civil rights violation. I mean, he basically sexually harassed a litigant who wanted her to sit on his face for words to that effect. That, that is different. It is different to take to a quintessential public forum and cry foul. And from Mr. Jones's perspective, look, this is, this is how he looks at the world. They press, they press, they press for metadata. Um, they get it. And lo and behold, they just happen to find a needle in a haystack, or as he put it in his broadcast, a needle in a haystack in a field of haystacks. How convenient was that? Now, my, from my perspective, it wasn't that at all. Um, the other side probably had the resources to hire a sophisticated data mining firm, and it was found. So I understand you take the position that um, nowhere in the transcript does Mr. Jones um, uh, claim that plaintiff's counsel asked for the metadata so that they could print the child porn. But assuming that that statement was 
somewhere in there. Would that be sanctionable behavior on these uh, in this matter? For I, I think it might be def a defamatory comment, um, you know, suggesting that they engaged in odious conduct. But for the life of me, I don't see how that affects the administration of justice. Don't be played for a fool here, Judge. From the day I've gotten involved in this case, the San Diego plaintiffs have done nothing but try to leverage a discovery problem into a default of one sort or another so that this court or any court can avoid addressing this case on the merits. That's because on the merits, they fail. Schneider v. Phelps talked about intentional emotional distress, not sustainable. The only claim they have, and the reason they press so hard on this ridiculous marketing data theory of theirs, is they want to associate knowingly false comments with the sale of commercial products. That's what this case has come down to. Last night at 735, I sent an email over with a complicated group of Google Analytics, unknowing whether you had yet ruled on our motion for clarification. Um, we are anxious to litigate the merits of this case, but the court shouldn't be used um, in the crisis of the wheat club um, by the plaintiffs um, in an effort to avoid deciding issues that are at the core of this republic. Mr. Jones is an easy scapegoat, especially in Connecticut, where we all know people who suffered tragically as a result of Sandy Hook. But if it's Mr. Jones today, who's going to be tomorrow? And what sort of speech are we going to regret it because it makes us uncomfortable and we don't like it? If Mr. Matty truly believes that he can persuade a law enforcement official that to truly and with integrity think that there's a sustainable cause of action in a criminal court, let's have it. My client is prepared to address those allegations in any court, any time. And before you ask for sanctions, Judge, maybe you ought to have him come up here, sit on that witness stand and tell you what was in his mind. This is an extreme remedy and an extreme proposal, which from my mind is shocking and goes to the core of what makes this republic sustainable. The right to speak freely, to criticize the government, to criticize your critics, and to swing back when you are swung at. The, you know, the Koskoff firm is brilliant at hiding behind litigation privilege. Um, it's no mystery to me that on a Tuesday night a pleading gets filed and on Wednesday morning it's CNN, and we can do nothing to strike back. Jones takes to an equal, and, um, and, 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 and an equal counterweight his own network and speaks back, and the consequence is going to be what? We can't fully and fairly litigate a First Amendment claim? Don't go there. I would be ashamed to call myself a Connecticut resident if that's what happened in this court. I do have an expensive witness on the stand with the clock running upstairs, Judge. <laughs> I'm sorry, do you? No, I'm in, I'm in up here. Okay. Somebody, Mr. Mr. Jones believes that somebody is financing this litigation. Because it, it, it wasn't brought until after the statute expired us to notice things because it was brought after Hillary Clinton lost the 2016 election. His, his info wars helped mobilize a lot of anti-Hillary uh, voters with rhetoric that you and I might find objectionable. That was their right to do so. Um, he believes that this litigation is financed by third parties. And we actually in, in, proposed a, a discovery request in our despair of pleading or two ago asking for permission to ask that question. Who paid for the $100,000 data search that just happened to find this? These are questions we'll get answers to someday, maybe not here today, but I don't see how you go from there to question Mr. Mary. I just don't. Well, I'm just, it's hard for me to get past the various um, comments by Mr. Jones um, about how coincidental, like it, it was from Star County, here, of course, that they asked for the metadata and they asked for this information and they just happened to find it. Put yourself in Mr. Jones' position. You, you pay hundreds of thousands of dollars, not to me, unfortunately, but you pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to lawyers who are looking through 9.6 emails, million emails. You fight about it in court for months. You turn over 60,000. A weeks pass, the other side asks for metadata. You give them the metadata. Metadata you don't even know how to read. You can't afford to pay somebody to read. And within days of that, um, oh, we just happened to find a piece of child porn. Maybe there aren't any coincidences, coincidences in the world. I don't think there is any evidence to suggest that Koshkov, Koshkov, and Peter did it. I've known these lawyers forever. They used to be yeah, friends. No, I understand that. I, but I've known these lawyers forever. But listen, they, and, and, and they used to be friends prior to this case. I don't know what's become of that. 
Um, but the fact of the matter is, Jones is entitled to his suspicions. He did not disrupt the administration of justice. And if you've got a former federal prosecutor in here that's saying as a result of this, he can't do his job, then maybe you should get him off the case because he's not prepared to serve his client. Rough cases yield rough emotions. Mr. Mann can take it. He ran for statewide office. In fact, he's no private person. He's a public person. And even last night, Senator Murphy, who rode Sandy Hook into the Senate, put a, a, a Alex Jones child porn bumper sticker on the car for his next campaign. This nonsense has to stop. And my client's entitled to push back. <coughs> Well, Your Honor, I thought you had the excuse to attend to my other matter. You may, but I, I am just so you know, I'm going to hear from Attorney Gloss, probably take the five minutes recess. So I understand. I just have a witness that I couldn't find. Thank you. I think the harder uh, decision, Your Honor, would be if there was even a grain of sand worth of contrition in that statement. There wasn't. There was blame shifting. There was a denial of what his client did while he was sitting there at a table. He was saying, effectively, it's our fault. And I want to just go back to basic principles. And this is a fact. The only reason this came out, only reason, is because Mr. Jones. Sorry, I just want to make sure I, I want to make sure co counsel is there. And I appreciate you I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. I want to be crystal clear about this. The counsel call, said that Mr. Jones had a right to respond to being called a pedophile. This wasn't going to come out, except he chose for it to come out. June 12th, we told them. We didn't do anything with it. We weren't going to do anything with it. It's not relevant to this case. However it wound up there is irrelevant. He chose on June 14th with his lawyer sitting there to make this an issue. He chose Can to I bring this. Can I just ask the defense, is there any, um, there's nothing that I've heard or read that suggests that the plaintiffs disclosed this um, either in the lawsuit or to the press or not to my knowledge, Your Honor, but uh, uh, just to echo Attorney Pattis' sentiment, it seems like the, the pleadings in this case have a, uh, sus constantly get leaked out to the press. They're on the news the next day. So there's no reason to think that that wasn't going to happen. So with show this. me the, well, the question. I just want to see how this information came out to the public since there was a claim that um, I believe you said that he was upset because he was called a pedophile. pedophile. Is there a pleading that the I, I, filed? Excuse me, Your Honor, I, I apologize. I think I said that he was rightfully upset because somebody was attempting to frame him for being a pedophile. He didn't blame um, the attorney, the plaintiff's attorneys here. Okay. I thought you said that he called him a pedophile. But there's no, you, the plaintiffs here didn't file any pleadings or go to the press or do anything until after. Not to my knowledge, Your Honor. Sorry, Not to my make knowledge. Sure we're on the same page. Let's take out the not to my knowledge. It didn't happen. The first disclosure of these emails was by Alex Jones with Mr. Pattis sitting next to him at a table in Austin, Texas on their public show, period. That's how this all came out. He's created this controversy. He didn't respond to something that we did. He chose to make this public. He chose to bring this out. And he's, gonna have, he's got the consequences of, of whether that was a good choice or not. He's got the right to free speech, but he's also got a responsibility that if, if, his, if his speech crosses the line, then he's got, there are consequences for that. That's why we're here. There is, Your Honor, a, a, there are lots of important principles that govern the United States and the operation of a, of a reasoned society. And one of them is open courts where people can have a controversy heard fairly. This isn't something, we, we haven't threatened anybody. We haven't said that we're gonna put somebody's head on a spike. And let me just address one thing that Mr. Pattis said that there is a suspicion that this is being financed by somebody else. Irrelevant if it was, it's not. This is, we are not getting a dollar from anybody anywhere. So that, and that, I'm sure that's not going to convince Mr. Jones because I guess he can believe what he wants to believe. But this is a, this is a matter that we've decided to take on uh, because we think it's, a, it's the reasonable right thing to do for these people that lost so much and continue to lose much. So. I want to, I want to, I want to just follow up a little bit on on the concept that Mr. Jones is the one who brought this out. If you listen to the tape, he says we're going to expose a major criminal issue. This was planned, Your Honor. This was a deliberate choice by Mr. Jones to bring this out. 
we just heard that there was a, a uh, that we have this hundred thousand dollars allegedly that we must have paid to have electronic electronically stored information reviewed. Well, let's look at page five of the transcript, Your Honor, from June fourteenth, where Mr. Jones says. I'm not an IT person. I've had to spend time I didn't have trying to figure out what the hell is going on and brought, it, brought in outside consultants and spent hundreds of thousands of dollars. I won't even tell you the number, a half a million dollars, trying to figure out to answer the discovery. So this claim that he doesn't have any resources and that these emails were inadvertently produced to us because he doesn't have the ability to do the right thing and follow the rules, nonsense. He said on his show he spent a half a million dollars on IT. So let's talk, Your Honor, about exactly what Mr. Jones said. And because I, I think that, that you really didn't get an answer to this from Mr. Pattis, so let's spend a couple of minutes, if you can, talking about what he said. Let's go to page 17 of the July 14th transcript. I know what they do when you expose them. They say you're a pedophile. We knew it was coming. And when the Obama appointed US attorney demanded out of 9.6 million emails in the last seven years, since Sandy Hook metadata, which meant tracking the emails and where they went, well, we fought it in court. The judge ordered for us to release a large number of those emails. That's Chris Matty that got that done. A very interesting individual with the firm of Koskoff and Koskoff, run by Senator Murphy and Senator Blumenthal, that say, for America to survive, quote, I must be taken off the air. A little later on uh, page uh, 18. So we learned in just the last few days that when they wanted these hundreds of thousands of emails out of the 9.6 million, that they had attachments to them that no one would know what they were. Well, actually, that's not true that no one would know what they were. Any res responsible ESI data firm would know exactly what they were. That's what we did. But that's interesting, this going back to the transcript. We checked with real IT people because we're not IT folks. We made some calls and they said, no, you wouldn't know that, that what was in the attachments and you wouldn't know what they linked to because the FBI looked and they said, we're the victim, it was hidden. In Sandy Hook emails, threatening us, there was child porn. So it's on record. We were sent child porn. We're not involved in child porn. But the fact is, it's not a needle in a haystack, it's fields of haystacks. And they get these emails, they being our firm, get these emails a few weeks ago and they go right to the FBI and say, we've got him with child porn. The FBI says, we never opened it. He didn't send it. And then they act like, oh, they're our friends. They're not going to do anything with this. Well, that's exactly what was going to happen. So uh, the, let's talk about the head on a pike line that Mr. Pattis mentioned. Your, page 21, you're trying to set me up with child porn. I'm going to get your ass, $1 million, $1 million, you little gang members, $1 million to put your head on a pike, $1 million, bitch. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Well, I, I would prefer them to not read from the transcript. I've, I've been through it. All right. More than enough. So, this is sort of summarize your argument. Well, the, the only other one I would just mention, Your Honor, is if I, if I can, at page 25, they literally went in there and found this hidden stuff. In other words, expressly saying that, that we got these 58,000 emails and knew where to go because this is something that we must have been involved in. That's just false. It's wrong, and to make that accusation, it's not an email or a voicemail uh, that, is some, that, is, that is left on, on some lawyer's cell phone. What happened here, he's got hundreds of affiliates. This went out to hundreds of stations. It went out to anybody who can click on his website. And, and the fact is that this is something that he knows causes problems. It caused a problem with the, with the pizza case. Uh, somebody got arrested for going uh, to, the, to that facility. One of the people, uh, one of the parents in Sandy Hook was threatened uh, by one of his listeners and, and, uh, uh, and, and was arrested. So this is, this is not a surprise. Right now, Your Honor, there is a uniformed Bridgeport police officer standing in our lobby. He's going to be there indefinitely. That's what we feel that we need to do based on what has happened in this case up to this point. Just, a, I'm gonna to touch a couple of other quick things. Uh, the, uh, the, your Honor knows, uh, you've seen what the standard is under the law. The, one of the interests that is at issue here is the right to have a case fairly adjudicated without harassment, without threats. I think there was a, ultimately a concession uh, that uh, that the court has power to sanction in the event of harassing or intimidating behavior. 
I, I just don't see how any reasonable reading of this these two transcripts uh, can, can lead the court to any other conclusion that this was harassment. It was a deliberate attempt to, uh, uh, to intimidate and it was not something that's protected. By the way, the standard is not the criminal First Amendment standard. This is a civil, uh, this is the, the power of the court to control its own litigation, the parties before it, and the processes before it. This exceeds any kind of sanctionable conduct that the Connecticut courts have ever considered and really exceeds sanctionable conduct in some of the federal cases that we've cited to Your Honor. So uh, the, I think, unless the, Your Honor has any questions, I, I'll. Your Honor, we'll, we'll uh, stand on Attorney Pattis's argument. Um, I'll just say, I guess reasonable minds could disagree because of all the sections and, and all the, you'd say, grandstanding that that we're seeing here, reading from the transcript, I'm not seeing any threats to Attorney Matty here. I, you know, it's it's not great language. Um, it's it, it's bad language in some points, but it's not a, an apparent threat. So thank you, Judge. I'll take a two-minute recess. Thank you. All rise.